We'll go right in to section 1.2. If I didn't tell you, you probably wouldn't even realize we were covering a new section. All right, our goal. I've said this a few times. But we start with a system. Maybe it's too complex for us to just look at it and solve in our head. We write the system as a matrix. We perform row operations on the matrix until it is simple. Then we use the matrix to recover the system, and the system will inherit the matrices simplicity. Then we solve the simple system, and because we're only modifying the matrix in these three allowable ways, we're only performing these row operations, the simple system and the complex system will have the same solution. So solving the simple system will let us solve the complex system. That's our goal. And before we go into what row operations we want to perform, we should start by defining what we mean when we say a matrix, when we say we want a simple matrix. So um, that will be our first step. And we'll need a few preliminary definitions, or I guess one preliminary definition. And it's a pretty straightforward uh, definition. The leading entry. is the first non-zero number in that row. So, for example, Say we have this three by three matrix. The first non-zero entry in the first row is the one. First non-entry in the second row is that other one. The third row does not have any leading entries. With this definition under our belt, We can give a definition of simplicity. This isn't the one we're going to actually settle on, but a matrix is in row echelon form. No use asking me where this name comes from or what the word echelon means in this context because I have no idea. But it's in row echelon form if one, 
any row of all zeros is below any row with non zero entries. Going back a slide, um, this matrix does happen to be in row echelon form. You see there are three rows. The first two rows have non-zero entries. The last row doesn't. The last row only has zeros, and this row that only has zeros is below the two rows with non-zero entries. Two. Every entry below a leading entry is zero. Again, going back to this frame, here are our leading entries. Here are the numbers below the first leading entry. Here's the number below the second leading entry. All the numbers below the leading entries are zero. Another way to think of number two, let's call it 2a. Every leading entry is to the right. Of the leading entry in the row above it. So again, we can see that here. We have these two leading entries. That second leading entry, the one in the second row, is to the right of the leading entry in the first row. So as you go down the matrix, the leading entries go from the left to the right. And what I've called 2 and 2a are logically equivalent. They're the same way of expressing the same idea. It's kind of a pain, but if a matrix is in row echelon form, that matrix is simple enough to solve. An augmented matrix. I should say. So let's say we have this augmented matrix. I'm saying that it's augmented and I'm using the augmented matrix notation. So this corresponds to a system of linear equations. 
And the only thing we lose when we store a system this way, if uh, we lose the variable names, whether our variables were x, y, z, or r, s, t, or whatever, we lose that. But the first column corresponds to the first variable. Let's use x1. The second column corresponds to the second variable. The third column corresponds to the third variable. The last column corresponds to equality. Each row corresponds to an equation. And if we start at the bottom and work up, that last equation is 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 1x3 equals 3. Well, of course, these zeros you can just ignore, and you wind up with x sub 3 equals 3. Then continuing to work up, that second equation says 0x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 equals 1. Well, this 0x1 we can ignore. x sub 3 is 3. So we know what 2x3 is. 2 times x3 is 2 times 3, which is 6. So the second equation says x2 plus 6 equals 1, x2 must equal negative 5. And then we keep working up. Now we're in the first row, 1x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 equals 4. Well, x3 is 3, so 3 times x3 is 9. x2 is negative 2, so 2 times negative 2, sorry, uh, wait, what? x2 is negative 5, so 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. So 1x1 minus 10 plus 9 equals 4. Uh, minus 10 plus 9 is minus 1. <clears throat> X1 equals 5. So if a matrix is in row echelon form, it's simple enough to solve. But not simple enough that solving it is really convenient. <laughs> And like, if we had, you know, even a small matrix, remember that like, stuff like the Google algorithm, that's a, like a billion by a billion or something. So, you know, a 10 by 10 matrix is small, but I mean, if you imagine trying to do this by hand with a 10 by 10 matrix, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be great. It would be a huge time sink, and then you'd probably make a mistake computing x6 or something, and all your numbers would be wrong anyway. So this is sort of theoretically simple enough. In practice, we are going to want a simpler form. 
But the way we're going to learn an algorithm for simplifying a matrix, and it's going to take a complex matrix, it's going to make it simpler, and then it's going to make it as simple as possible. And this simpler matrix is in row echelon form. So in practice, row echelon form is an intermediate step. It's something you arrive at on your quest to make the matrix as simple as possible. Well, we have to, I mean, in this flow chart I have, we have to go from a complex matrix to a simpler matrix as our first step. So even if we really don't think row echelon form is good enough, we need to be able to put the matrix in row echelon form as part of our quest to, to get it into something even simpler. And the method for taking a matrix and putting it into row echelon form is called Gaussian elimination. And we are not going to spend this semester doing Gaussian elimination by hand. That's a terrible prospect. That's why TI-84s are required for this course. But we'll spend a few sections just trying to sort of understand the algorithm. We don't want to do it by hand, but we also don't want to get to the point where we're just putting stuff into our calculator and, you know, it's a little magic box and we don't know how it's doing any of the things it does. We do want to understand this algorithm. So I'm going to go through this using an example, because trying to talk about this algorithm without an example is, is a doomed undertaking. So this first step might or might not be necessary, depending on the matrix but we're going to swap our rows to make the upper left entry non-zero. And I mean, you can, you can perform Gauss, Gaussian elimination on any matrix, not just augmented matrices. Um, there are reasons you might want to do it. For now, we're just looking at augmented matrices, and this should always be possible to do. If it weren't possible to do this, that would mean we have all zeros in the first row. Now, if this is an augmented matrix, the first row would correspond to a variable. 
but the first equation has a zero x one, the second equation has zero x one, the third equation has zero x one, x1 doesn't actually appear in any of the equations, so what's it, what's it doing in the matrix? So, we'll just assume that this is possible. And again, you know, maybe the upper left entry is already non-zero, and you don't have to do this step. But... But in this case, it isn't. And we have freedom here. If we swap the first and the third entry, that would do what we wanted it to. If we swap the first and the second entry, that would do what we want. In general, if you're doing this by hand, I think it's usually easier to have a smaller number in the upper left. So let's get that two up there. mistyped something, I just didn't actually do that swap. And now we're going to take this upper left entry and we are going to use it to turn every entry below it to zero. So we're going to turn this entry to zero, and we would turn that entry to zero if it weren't already zero. And we're going to do this, scrolling way back, we're going to do this like we did on this frame from section 1.1. We'll multiply the first row by some number and add it to the second row in such a way that this number, this four in the second row, becomes a zero. And I think sometimes this is sort of easy to do in your head, sometimes it isn't, since this is sort of our first Gaussian elimination example, let's think it out. We've got this second row, four, two, one, one. And we're going to add something to the second row. And our goal is to turn that four into a zero. Our goal is to, literally just repeating the same second twi se uh, sentence twice, our goal is to turn that four into a zero via addition. So the number we need is four. Four plus negative four is zero. How are we going to get this four? or rather this negative four. Well, we're going to take the first row, which is two, three, one, zero. We're going to multiply it by something. 
thing to get a new row. And then we're going to add that new row to the second row. And I mean, the question is always, what do you multiply by? And sometimes if you have like ugly fractions, maybe you have to stop and think. But if we want to multiply this by something, to turn this two into a negative four, the number we're looking for is negative two. Multiplying the first row by negative 2 will give us negative 4, negative 6, negative 2, 0. We multiply it by the second row. Um, we add it to the second row, I meant to say. And this is our new second row. So our matrix is now Remember that we're not when we perform this row operation we're not actually changing the first row I know I kept talking about multiplying the first row by stuff but that's an intermediate step that we're going to use to change the second the first row was 2, 3, 1, 0. It remains 2, 3, 1, 0. The second row is now 0, negative 4, negative 1, 1. The third row we haven't touched, it's 0, 2, 3, negative 1. And now we would repeat this process to turn this number down here to 0, except it, it's already zero, so that's not necessary in this particular example. And now we are done with that top row. We're basically done with that far left column. Gaussian elimination works down and to the right. We've used this leading entry to um, turn everything below it to zero. Now we go to the second row and we find its leading entry and we use this leading entry to turn everything below it to zero. Uh, it's a little tedious. The instant, the instant fractions start appearing, I, it uh, makes me unhappy. But, so we're going to take that second row, we're going to multiply it by something. And we're going to add it to the third row. And our goal is to turn this 2 into 0. So we want a 0 there. So to add 2 to something and get 0, we need a negative 2. Um, so this. This negative 4 has to be multiplied by something to turn it into negative 2. And we do that arithmetic and we say 1 half. Negative 4 times 1 half is negative 2. Zero. 
zero times one half is zero. Negative one times one half is negative one half. One times one half is one half. We do the addition. Let me let me just use decimals here. Three minus one half is two point five. Negative one plus one half is point five. No, negative negative, negative point five. Thank you. So there's. our new third row. And the reason this algorithm works, or a reason this algorithm works, is that once we have used um, a leading entry to turn something below it to zero, this algorithm never unzeroes it. Once something becomes zero, it stays zero. So we didn't have to use the algorithm to turn that to a zero. It was a zero already. But you note that it remains a zero. So this zero remains zero. We now have zero here. 2.5, negative 0.5. And then if you have a large matrix, I mean, you can just keep doing this um, until, until you can't anymore, until you're done. Moving down and to the right, that's our next leading entry. We should use it to turn everything below it to zero, but there is nothing below it, so we're done. And, and this matrix is in row echelon form. Here are our leading entries. Everything below a leading entry is zero. Um, there are no rows of all zeros, so that part of the definition doesn't arise. So what I said that we that we can't always, I mean, can't keep doing this by hand. You can sort of um, see that this could get tedious. Um, Especially, I mean, if, if your matrix had, you know, ugly decimals in it, it would be, it would be a mess. But, but this is what the, the row, the Gaussian elimination process is. It's what your calculator is doing behind the scenes when your calculator performs this process. Any questions about, about this? Did I? Then let's define, this is an intermediate step. Let's, uh, We're, we're on our way to what we actually want. And what we actually want is reduced row echelon form. Let's define it. Let's show us how we get it, and we won't quite finish section 1.2, but 
I think we never do. I just refuse to update my schedule, even though every semester I run into this problem. Um, reduce the row echelon form. So reduced row echelon form is a more powerful or a sort of souped up row echelon form. So for a matrix to be in reduced row echelon form, bless you, it has three requirements. And the first requirement is that it has to be in row echelon form. The second requirement is that all the leading entries have to be one. The third requirement is that all numbers above a leading entry must be zero. So all of the numbers below a leading entry have to be zero to be in row echelon form. Now we're demanding that all the numbers above the leading entry have to be zero. How do we get into reduced row echelon form? So first, Some, some terminology. We cannot skip to row echelon form, to reduced row echelon form. We take the complex matrix, we get it into row echelon form, then we simplify it further. So the process of going from here to here is called Gaussian elimination. The process of going all the way from complex to reduced is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. And we're running low on time, but let me, let me show you this. We started with this matrix as an example. We performed Gaussian elimination. We got here. Let's keep going. Two, three, one, zero. Zero, negative four, negative one, one. Zero, zero, two point five. That might be easier to work with fractions now. 
So 2.5 is what? 5 halves? And negative 0.5 negative one half. So now, in the Gaussian elimination, we started on the upper left and we worked down and to the right. To finish this out, we're going to start at the lower right and we're going to work up and to the left. And remember that we're working with leading entries here, which is why when I say we're starting at the lower right, I didn't actually circle the lower rightmost entry. I circled the lower rightmost leading entry. So, um, we want that two-fifths to be that five halves to be a one. So there's a row operation that we just haven't used and don't ever use in, in Gaussian elimination, multiplying a row by a constant. Never need to do it. Here, if we want to turn five halves into one, we can multiply this row by two-fifths. And now, I don't think I'm going to have time to finish this. But we'll just think we used leading entries to turn everything below them to zero. We can use leading entries to turn everything above them to zero. So in particular, I mean, this third row times one plus the second row. We'll turn the second row to zero, negative four, zero, four fifths. And uh, best practices is not to use more than one row operation in a single step. But we're running out of time, so let's also turn this one to zero. If we multiply the second row by negative one and add it to the first row, negative one plus one will be a zero. And the, the nice thing about this process. I mean, it was it was such a pain to um to do the Gaussian elimination, and it must seem like ah oh, now we have to do it again. But finishing the Gauss-Jordan elimination is quicker because you have all of these zeros, like. When I multiplied this third row by negative one and I added it to the first row, the two didn't change, the three didn't change, this changed to zero, only the last entry changed in a way that I had to think about. And now we're running out of time. I mean, we real we were, now we're basically out of time, but you move up and to the right. Turn this negative four, it's a leading entry, it needs to be one, turn it into one. How do you do that? How do you do that? Multiply it by one fourth. Multiply it 
close. Multiply it by negative one fourth. This will turn to one. This will turn to negative one fifth. Use this one to get rid of the three. Multiply the second row by negative three, add it to the row above it. Uh, positive three fifths plus one fifth will give us four fifths. This will turn to zero. Up and to the left. Now that 2 is the next leading entry. We want that 2 to be 1. Multiply the first row by 1 half. So I'll post the video for this. If, you, if you're a little fogged now, you'll be able to come back and review it at your leisure. Ah, reduced row echelon form. And the reason, let's bear with me if we go like one or two minutes over, the reason reduced row echelon form is so great is that when you think of, I mean, it, this is an augmented matrix. We've got these variables and these equations, and you can just read all of your answers out. x1 plus 0x2 plus 0x3 is 4 tenths. So x1 is 4 tenths. 0x1 plus x2 plus 0x3 is negative 1 fifth. So x2 is negative 1 fifth. 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 1x3 equals negative 1 fifth. x3 is negative 1 fifth. So, uh, Getting this matrix into reduced row echelon form allows you to solve the corresponding equation without, I mean, this clearly just reading off the answers like this is neater than trying to work from the bottom up and substitute values in and do all of that. All right, sorry for running a little over. I'll see you, um, let me see, we didn't finish 1.2. I'll push that assignment back next week. 1.1 is still due. So um, get, get that done and I'll see you next Tuesday.